Hi, this is Jason Squire. I am a cycling instructor at Sweatshop here in Los Angeles, and you are listening to my interview with Elaine Goodman at gogoodman.com.au. Where did your passion for fitness come from? Uh, well, both my wife and I started when we were kids. Um, Mimi uh, spent some time in Australia uh, during her formative years, and uh, when she was 13, 14, and when she was over there, uh, their fitness that they do in school was, is completely different from what we have here in the States. And so in the wintertime, she spent a great deal of her school time skiing, cross-country skiing, downhill skiing, doing a lot of different things. Fitness was a big part of the curriculum there. So when she came back to the States at age 15, she found that she was suddenly, you know, at a loss in terms of uh, getting on all this energy because there just was nothing here to match it in her school at school and so then she started searching out things at, at age 15 16 she started she started spinning when she was 16 which is even even in the states that's quite young and so uh, her passion for training started then and it's never faltered um, for me uh, my whole family all have big fitness backgrounds and so um, growing up was just sort of part of my life and then I got pretty serious when I turned 19. <laughs> started bodybuilding for many years and then transitioned from that into triathlons and um, at about the same time as when I, I didn't discover spinning until I was 31 and that just became a big part of my life. Uh, something for fun, I started teaching uh, just as a sidekick. Um, it wasn't, didn't do it for money, it was just doing it for fun. Me and I met at a spin studio, uh, started dating within a couple of years, got married, started a family, and then one day uh, she literally said, we were sitting at breakfast, and she's like, I think we should open a spin studio. And I said, uh, all right, I'm, I'm game. And she's like, but let's make it a heated a heated room. <laughs> and I'm always up, the harder the better. So that sounded fantastic to me. Uh, it, all, it literally all started right there, and then we started working on it. It took us about a year uh, before we got the actual studio open from that point. Let's backtrack a little bit did you say you originally were into bodybuilding and then transition into into triathlons yeah for me yes that's how that was you know i grew up in a family my brother was a big athlete he played at minor league baseball for a while my mother my earliest memories of my mother are of her running on the track and um, my brother and i were both very athletic as was my sister so it was just part of the family but i i didn't Unlike my brother, who has a very clear, direct talent, my sister, too, she was a swimmer, I wasn't very good at any specific sport. And so at about 19, I just needed a, I needed a channel for all my energy. And uh, that sort of seemed to be something that did take a lot of skill, per se, in terms of, you know, agility and things like that. And I took to it. My body took to it very quickly. And I found that it was something that both uh, I mentally and physically was matched for. And so for the next... I'm going to say about eight years. That's about all I did was bodybuilding. I just I, I'd hit the gym, split workouts twice a day. Uh, probably spent about two and a half to three hours a day in the gym those first many years, which you know some would say is overkill. Others would say that's about right. Some would say it's insane, but you know, uh, for me it worked. And then um, I had a couple injuries, and I wasn't. A pro, you know, I, I was never going to actually compete. I wasn't that good, but it, it taught me a lot of things about um, discipline and form and how to do things properly. And as I slowly transitioned out of bodybuilding, I took all of those principles and applied them to the other formats of training that I did. And I found that the um, underlying principles were the same, and they helped me, especially when I got into spinning and as part of my teaching. A lot of what I, I learned in bodybuilding, a lot of rules I learned there, I apply to the spin bike into class. And, um, that's, that's how I've gotten to it. How long did it take you to transition from bodybuilding into, triath into being a triathlete? Because it's not only losing the weight, but I wouldn't imagine that bodybuilders have an extreme fitness base like you need for, for a triathlon. So how, uh, so how long did that well, transition take? You know, it was... Spinning was a part of that because I did have to lean out and I did lose weight. I was I, again. How much weight did you lose? Uh, I, I'm. Uh, I'm. Only, I only dropped about twenty pounds. 
So it wasn't like I, I'm not a big guy to begin with. So it, it was not like I had to lose a lot. If I had really wanted to try to compete on a semi-pro level, I would have had to lose probably another 20 pounds. Because it was just I still carried too much muscle weight than what would have been you know ideal. But I would say it was about a two to three year transition, and I still lifting weights is still a very key part of my training. I've never given that up. I just don't do it anywhere near the scale that I did, you know, 15 years ago. It just it doesn't serve purpose for me. But I still go to the gym about three days a week. I do about an hour of weights. You know, which is, is, you know, if you talk to anybody who's actually a heavyweight lifter or a bodybuilder, that's not a lot of time. But for me, it, it maintains what I want, keeps me strong. And given all of the um, all of the, the studies that have come out over the last five years about the positive effects of weight training on your body as you age, as well as helping the mind, you know, I've discovered that these are things that I think I'll probably keep. I'll probably keep it part of my training regimen until I can't do it anymore. What's your aim fitness wise? Obviously, you said you're you're a triathlete, and now you're you're big on spin and uh, heat training. Is was there something more back then that the drive that drove you than just being fit and healthy? Was it a confidence thing? Uh, I, <laughs> I would say it was a sanity thing. Uh, you know, you meet those people. I, I have been told more than once uh, in my lifetime. You know, I've had acquaintances i wouldn't say friends i would not say friends or family because they you know understand how i tick as well as how my wife ticks she also needs the training but um for me the athletic part of my life because again to me there's you can you can train like a pro and think like a pro pro athlete and eat like a pro athlete does not mean you're going to be able to go and compete with pro athletes nor does it mean you're ever going to be able to train on their scale but Given what your natural abilities are, you can behave the way they do and reap the benefits of that. And that, to me, I fit into that category. I, I've never had, I've never been quote unquote talented enough to excel in where I would stand out in a crowd in terms of my overall ability. You know, if we did a race or anything like that. However, my mental capacity, my desire for it, that you know has always been there, and um, I've always needed a, a physical outlet to basically center my life, and that's what the training does. I, in fact, all, from college on, my my weekly schedule has always been built around my training, even though it's not something I make money on. I mean, now I do to a degree, but it's always been something that I, I would always lock my training schedule in first. The entire rest of my day got built around that. Work, play family now it's family and and uh that stuff but it still all gets built around that it's a little harder now than it used to be but to some degree that still it still works that way now i read that it took many 11 years between 96 and 07 to master the medium of cycling i'm not sure how long it took you i'm guessing around a similar time what does what does that exactly mean to master spin Oh, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> well, you know, well, I mean, only because I, I come at it, I've been teaching now, let me see, I started spinning in 2001, I was in my early 30s, and um, I was, you know, quite fit and athletic at the time, but the spin bike took me in a way, I was really very bad, I was really terrible on it. And it took me a long time, six months even, until like I was even remotely adequate. And that's one of the key reasons I teach is because because it took me so long to even feel like I was doing something rudimentary, rudimentarily, rudimentary decent on the bike. I one day went, that's it. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna own this bike. I'm gonna become a teacher and I'm gonna get really good on it. And then I literally went to weekend certification and I got certified. And then I just, like anything in my life, I threw myself in with everything, and I started teaching. I mean, I had a full-time day job, but I still I started teaching five classes right out of the gate. At one point, I was teaching nine classes. I taught every – I always taught on the bike. I don't – instructors who teach off the bike, no disrespect, but to me, that's not really teaching spin. You, you've got to be riding with your students, and you have to be on it. And so, in, And in terms of mastering it, I would say I've been teaching now uh, 12 years, 
and I still feel like I'm a journeyman as a teacher. I mean, I consider myself a good teacher, and um, I, but I continue to learn on the bike every day from a teaching standpoint by watching, you know, what the students like, don't like, you know. Um, I try new things, and that may seem months I'm doing until there's only so much you can do on a spin bike. But given the range in, of music that's out there, and a spin bike is different from a road bike. A road bike is pretty clear how you ride a road bike. I mean, you are most of the time in the saddle. To come out of the saddle, you only do that when you're climbing heavy hills or you're doing a solid pickup. Spinning's completely different. The bike's ergonomically set up differently. And you can do a lot of work in third with lightweight, medium weight, heavyweight. You can move down to the saddle. And then you have all the different moves that you can get done. You've got jumps, push-ups. You've got all kinds. And some studios do more than others. We don't like to have a huge range of movement at the studio, but there is some. And um, I, I would say, I guess, mastering spin itself, that you could probably do in, you know, if you're, if you're doing it a lot, you're spending five to ten years. But mastering the ability as a teacher in relation to that, just like I would think of any profession, you know, it, that takes 15, 20, 25 years to truly become a master. That's that's a personal opinion just about, you know, trying to teach people and understand what your job is as an instructor for the people that you're training with. I mean, I, I'm... I've been involved, like, going to the gym for a long time. I go, I have a personal trainer, and I've done weights and I've done cardio. It just depends on which tr- which trainer I have at the time. And when you th- yep. when you think about weights, there's always something you can do that's harder than what you're currently doing. Even if you get to, like, the heaviest level, you can slow down the reps or you can, you can speed up the reps or you can do one arm at a time or th- there's tons of different things. And to master it, it just takes ages like for example martial arts if you do martial arts you can never master it completely because there's always right. more I, things to do I agree well that, that to me that's how i do look at all of this i mean in my in my mind a true master is someone you you, you literally understand everything about what you're doing internally and you, there is no stone unturned. So by that definition, you can't really be a master until you get to death. Exactly. Now, I'm taking it to an extreme. You know, I'm taking it to an extreme. But to me, those, you know, if you go, anybody who is in the martial arts world, who is truly, who we consider a master, I'm sure that if you sat down with them and talked to them, they would look at themselves differently than how we would look at them. Plus, yeah, they are masters, pure and simple. So I don't think it would be that simple for them. So are you a self-titled master then? <laughs> no, I, I don't consider myself a master. That's that's what I'm saying. I do yeah. not consider myself by any stretch. I'm a journeyman at best. You know, I've got a long way to go. I mean, to me, there's so many things going on. If you really want to teach a good spin class, and, and again, there's the one side of me that goes, it's just spin. It's just a simple workout. Oh, but it's not just I've a simple workout. You know, you know um, I've seen people's lives change from it, and I've seen over the years how it affects people. Just everybody takes to their own particular medium of training. Spinning seems to attract people who, you know, they get pretty fanatical about it. And, you know, from a teaching standpoint, you've got to have your music down. It's always got to be different. Your workout cannot, to me, if your workout's the same every time, just like I learned in bodybuilding, you have to mix it up or else it will just get stale and your body will get used to it and then you stop growing. And the moment you stop growing, what's the point? So in teaching, it's the same thing. The moment my ego starts to get involved, the moment I'm even remotely not in the room while teaching, those are things that happen all the time that I have to gently push them out and go, wait a minute, what am I focusing on here? Now, to me, a master, those things don't happen to a master. And I don't know if that's actually possible, but that to me is what that means someone who is actually just able to be fully open and teach and be 100% available always. I, I, I don't know if it's doable. I know I haven't done it. So trust me, I, I do not, you, I would not ever want to call myself a master of spin by any stretch. And I, you know, that's, that's a title that would be, uh, it's something that is reserved for very unique individuals who've been doing something a very long time. 
What was the thought process behind the discovery of yours and your wife Mimi's very own spin technique, the sweat shop? And it's spelt S H O double P E. Is it still still pronounced shop? Yep, still so it's just the French. Okay. French shop. A. Um, that's all my wife. I mean, my wife came up with the idea of a hot spin room. All the branding. She she created the name. Mimi did. Anything you see in the shop, she literally wrote. Now it's funny. I'm the teacher. I, in, in terms of us and the couple, Mimi doesn't. She is certified. She could teach, but she doesn't teach classes. She does, however, do all of our training. She trains all our instructors. She wrote the manual. She does all of that. I don't handle any of that. And so we do make a good team in terms of, you know, I'm in the room every week. I'm teaching. I teach five classes a week. Uh, but Mimi is the one who actually trains our instructors who are on the floor teaching. And she put our, our program together. And so the program, I can't get into specifics about the format of it, but we basically are a classically trained spin. So if you know about spinning, there's a lot of differences out there. A lot of, um, we believe, really in utilizing the flywheel quite a bit. Uh, and using resistance as a part of the training. The heat itself we consider to be a training tool. It's not a gimmick. We've had, uh, from our own experience, from people who've spun with us, plus there have been studies done that prove the training in the heat. For example, the University of Oregon did a study of um, elite athletes, and they found that the athletes who trained in heat on a regular basis, their output increased by 7% over the um, other group who did not train in the heat. Now, to some people, 7% may not sound like a lot, but at an elite level, that's a significant gain. We take that down into our room um, with our riders, and we do have – we don't have any pro athletes yet in our room, but we do have quite a few Ironmen who train with us. Who uh, We have uh, guys who do anywhere from four to seven Ironman races a year, and they swear by the room in their off, off-season training. They have all said that to, to a guy – They've all said that the room has helped them increase their output considerably in their racing. And then we've got a lot of people who have lost significant amounts of weight over the last few years. I I consider heat, the heated room, to be an integral part of that. It's not the only reason, because there is a lifestyle branding that goes on in our place with uh, the chatter, the friendships that happen. You do as as others do. You spend time with them. You will start to want to, you know, stay are in better shape than you and you spend time with them, you want to start to, you know, do what they're doing because it's working. So, you know, there's that as well. But I consider the heat to be an integral part of that that progress and that success in the training. What were some of the tests and requirements you had to meet before you started to promote your own fitness technique? Uh, We didn't have, you know, um, when you say, I mean, rephrase that in terms of there's nothing regulating us. Okay, so there's nothing uh, like, like, for example, occupational health and safety, or there's no like fitness governing no. body or place you can go where the research is all done for you, and you can read over it just to make sure everything is covered. Well, I mean, we've done our own. We've read a lot of studies over the years about heat, in terms of where do we go. The, the first, I will say, the first year that we opened, it was a little bit hit and miss in terms of you know we were just sort of testing it out. We initially opened the studio, half our classes were heated half-word, regular spinning. Um, we have a classical-style spin studio. For example, the entire new wave of spinning, uh, which started with a particular studio out of New York, and the large majority of spin studios out there have copied that style, and they have about 35 to 40 minutes of spin, and then and they utilize weights throughout the class. Now, I personally don't feel weights on a bike when you should be in a prone position laying, you know, you're leaning forward and you have to be careful of your back. I don't see how utilizing weights on a bike, one, is safe, and two, can be in any way effective. Given my background in bodybuilding, I I don't see how, you know, doing some curls with a two-pound weight in your hands while you're spinning on a bike is going to be at all remotely effective for building muscle. But that is where a lot of the spin world has gone. Um, because one, one, two studios have had very a great deal of success nationally. We, however, do not do any of that. We have our own training program. It's more classically aligned. All 50 minutes is riding, spinning, and then we have a five-minute stretch. And I do feel calorie burn-wise, you know, we've got some of the highest calorie burn happening in the spin room. Uh, the combination of our training program and the heat 
uh, I, I'd be probably pretty comfortable saying we have some of the highest calorie burns on average happening of any spin studio in the country. But in terms of, um, think get back to your question, sorry. The answer uh, regarding um, safety, that first year we did sort of just, we, we didn't know exactly what we had. We read some of the studies. We know about heat. I, I mean, just from, you know, we knew probably didn't want to go over 85, 86. And that first year, we uh, the room was not set to exactly regulate the way we wanted it to. So sometimes it would get up to 86, 87, and I would watch the room as we were teaching. Your uh, exceptional students, they had no problem up to about 87 degrees. You get above 87 degrees, it starts to become anybody's game. I don't care how good a fitness you are, if you haven't had enough water or whatever, it, it could, you know, on a bad day take you down. Uh, 85 degrees is about the marker for average people. If you're just an average workout person, you get to about 85, you're good to go. But above 85, it starts to get a little, it, gets, it can get a little questionable. 83, 82, 83 is where we run the room. We found that that is an ideal temperature. Uh, we have all walks of life in our studio. We have people who are carrying a lot of extra weight. We have very thin people. We've got everybody in between. We don't, it's not like, you know, we don't have a bunch of, um, elite spelt athletes training in our studio. We've got a solid cross section of everybody out there, and they all love it. So uh, we did over time. We did develop the 83 degrees. It's about the safe marker. That's about where you want to keep the room. So 83 degrees Fahrenheit. I think 100 degrees Fahrenheit is about 37 degrees Celsius. So it's probably what just below 30 degrees Celsius. Maybe about 26, 27 degrees Celsius. Is that? Uh, I was, uh, that sounds that sounds about right. I don't know what the conversion is, but that sounds about right. If somebody comes into your studio, can you tell if they're going to be suitable for it? I mean, is there an age restriction or like a weight restriction? Obviously, you do. Do you do like test test each person beforehand to see if to see if their heart can nope. hold up and if their lungs can hold uh, up? Our oldest rider right now is seventy two. She rides about three times a week. She rides front row, which, you know, front row is sort of your prime real estate because everybody can see you. She's awesome. She doesn't have any trouble with it. Uh, we get people who are considerably overweight on occasion who ride with us regularly. Prior to when they first come in, everybody has to sign a waiver, and there's a questionnaire asking them if they've got any kind of medical conditions, anything like that. So... Um, if someone said they have a heart condition or if they, if someone's pregnant, anything like that, we ask them to check with their doctor before they spend with us. I mean, but we do try to remind everybody, 83 degrees is not very hot. I mean, out here in California, in Los Angeles, the majority of our year is 83 or above, all right? And people ride their bikes outside and they do things outside. It's just that when you combine that heat with a very intense workout, it forces you to become very focused in your training because you have to teach yourself how to breathe properly. And most people, they go walk around in 83, 83, 85, 90 degree heat. They don't think a lot about it. They just, it bothers them because they don't want to sweat. But it's not like, you know, people aren't used to that. I mean, back where I grew up, I grew up in Pennsylvania on the East Coast where in the summertime you had 90 degrees and all the humidity. I didn't stop. That didn't stop me or my friends from running around all day long in the summertime. So, you know, I think the heat to some degree is a little overstated as a concern of it. We, you know, up to date, we've been open now a little over four years, and we as of yet have anybody to come to us and say, "Hey, I, I couldn't do this, or this caused this this medical problem." I mean, so we do screen people. So as long as they're telling the truth on their forms. Uh, we haven't had any problems. Now, I've uh, I've studied fitness. I've been involved in fitness for most of my life for various health reasons. Um, the first question that comes to mind about this is one of the, the things that I believe, I don't know if it's a shared belief, but the first issue that comes to mind for me is shouldn't athletes be the only people that are training like athletes? I mean, is there, is there kind of like a a mark where it becomes too intense that it doesn't become fun any, fun anymore? <laughs> That's okay. You just tap on something. This is specific to me as, as a teacher because I talk about that. Okay. So <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> um, this, this is my mindset. You're talking to a man 
I don't have any special skills as an athlete. Uh, if I went and ran a triathlon, and if I did a triathlon right now, I would finish middle of the pack at best. If I had to go play a basketball game or try to play a baseball game, I can't hit an 80-mile-per-hour fastball. I can barely hit a 70-mile-per-hour <laughs> fastball. My brother, however, can hit a 100-mile-per-hour fastball. He has special skills. I do not. So when you're talking about people who think, train, eat like athletes, that doesn't mean that when I say train like an athlete, literally train like an athlete, literally go do what, uh, the guys on the L.A. Lakers are doing for their workouts or what the guys for the Philadelphia Eagles are doing in their workouts, I don't mean it literally. What I mean is is that pro athletes, Olympic athletes, everybody, an elite athlete, when they train, they train with purpose. They train in a way that they want it to transform them. They never go to a training session thinking, hey, I'm going to go do this session today. It doesn't really matter if it makes me any better or not. They never think like that. Whenever they go work out, they go work out with a reason, and their reason is to improve their ability. Why can't I train like that? That's how I've come to it. That's how my wife comes to it, and that's what we teach everybody who walks through our doors. We say, listen, don't walk in here and think that you're just here to just do. You're not just here to do. You're here to get better. Now, who does that? Athletes do that. We want you to train like an athlete. We want you to every time you come in to train, we want you to work to get better. Because if you get better, then all kinds of things around you improve. That's just how it happens. And then I add to that, that means you need to eat like an athlete. Don't go home and eat a whole big ba- bag of chips and a half carton of ice cream when you get home. Go home, eat some fruit, eat some vegetables, get some good solid protein, eat the way an athlete eats. That's how we talk about it. So, you know, it's, I'm not talking about a one-for-one here in terms of, you know, well, you need to do whatever they're doing. I want you to train the way they do, the way they think. Does that, I mean, does that make sense? Yeah, I guess that do you get people in your, in your classes that say, look, I want to do this just so that I'm able to enjoy life a little bit more, relax my diet a little bit more, but still keep that fitness base. That's why I'm here. That's why I want to do this so that it's not all one way. At least I'm doing something that's keeping me reasonably healthy so I can go out and enjoy life a little bit because that, that's probably why I'd say that's probably why the average person goes to the gym. Maybe. I, I, I would say at least half, if I asked, I would say at least half of our clientele base thinks just like that. And is that an issue but, for you? Does that go against what you just explained to me? No. They're telling me that – I look at it this way. If someone says that they just want to come train and they don't care if they get any better and they don't care if the class actually does anything for them, then I'm going to say, if I got up on the bike every day and I said, hey, okay, so just kind of do whatever you can do. It's okay if you don't do a lot. That's not my job. My job is to say, look, Here's the bar. Let's see how close you can get to the bar. Anywhere in a range from where you started, above where you started, that's great. But I'm not going to set the bar so low that it's a piece of cake to get there because then what's the point of coming and training? Because if it's so easy to do, people lose interest. you got to make it so that it's, you know, you got a high bar. And then if you do it, I mean, we have a lot of people who are very proud of themselves. Getting through a heated spin class is no easy thing. Doing it three or four times a week at the level that we teach at is definitely not an easy thing. And we have an entire cross-section of life. And I'm, I'm talking about people who are overweight to in just decent shape, who don't work out a lot, to these triathletes who do Ironman races. And they all come in and they all try to do their best. Now, one of the things that I say somewhat tongue-in-cheek is, listen, I don't want to have fun when I train. I want to hurt when I train. Because if I'm hurting and my body's in pain, then I'm growing because pain is the, is the best growth hormone in the world. It's free, and it's how you measure your growth. If you don't at least feel some suffering while you're training, then you're not growing, and we all know that that's true. So I say that somewhat tongue-in-cheek, and I say the more I'm hurting, the more fun I'm having. Now, everyone who knows me as a teacher, as an instructor, knows that I'm somewhat making a joke. I say it's, it's a half joke. Uh, because I do know of uh, studios out there 
where they literally said, we just want you to come have fun. I, I just I just can't understand the purpose of going and spending an hour, spending your money and your time doing something that's just fun. I can go to the movies for fun. I can go bowling for fun. I can go play with my son at the park for fun. I can watch him skateboard. That's fun. But when I'm training, I want to know that it is making my body healthier, stronger, and help me live longer. That's, I mean, maybe I fall into a, a different category because I, like, I... I, I'm going to say now I, I, enjoy, I enjoy food. I, I enjoy eating and all, all different kinds of all different kinds of food. Being Jewish, there's a lot of different options out there that are tasty, and there's a lot of festivals. <laughs> well, yeah, I that... understand we're, we're Jewish as well. Yes, yeah, my so, wife is an incredible cook, by the way. Yeah, and so, and there's there's a lot of festivals that are based around food and family. So you're kind of in a corner. But I do go to the gym twice a week. I try with a personal trainer. I try and go a couple more times if I have time. And the main thing we do. The main thing that my that my trainer trains in is boxing and basic self defense. So we we do a lot of boxing, and I enjoy that because not only is it keeping me fit and healthy, it's teaching me that if I get into trouble anywhere, that I've got a basic self defense background that I can pull out, and I'll be able to defend myself yeah. and try and get away. But I enjoy that. That's why I enjoy it because it's making me grow. It's teaching me something that I wouldn't know otherwise, but I enjoy the hell out of it. And it's, it's challenging doing all these different kind of Floyd Mayweather drills. It, it's teaching me, it's making me quicker and faster and stronger. But when I'm away from the gym, I don't mind having dinner out or enjoying dessert once in a while or having a choc top when I go to the movies. So it, do you get clients like oh, that? Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I do that. I go to, I eat popcorn. I love when my wife cooked this, you know, I had to, when we first got married that first year, it took me a little time to adjust because, you know, my background, uh, uh, boiled chicken and, and steamed broccoli and uh, some rice, you know, I get married. Suddenly I had this, uh, my wife cooked all these wonderful, really tasty meals. And I had to, be, I was never used to eating so much. So then I started to put some weight on. I said, wait a minute, I got to, I got to figure this out. So I, I understand that. And so when I say I want it to hurt first, all I mean is that for me, if I do a workout and I haven't hurt a little bit, then I, at the end of it, I'm not really happy because I don't feel that it was effective. And you, you said, when you do this work, it's challenging and you have fun doing it. I have no problem having fun with the workout if it's challenging. Yeah. But if for someone who just goes in and they do it because it's easy, I, I would just, that begs the question, why? Why are you going to go do something that really doesn't have any long-term impact upon the healthy condition of your body, the um, physical shape of your body? Now, if they say I do it because it really helps me mentally or emotionally, I get it. Okay, fine. That's that's completely fine because to me, training should help you physically, mentally, and emotionally. Yeah, I mean bo- I do boxing. Yeah, doing all the different. All three of those things. Yeah, doing all the different boxing routines. That's mentally challenging for me as well because I have to remember them all. We do it slowly, but then I have to remember it all and put it all together. So it's challenging me mentally as well. Yes, and, and to me, that all needs to be there in a, in a true regular. If you're going to train with someone on a regular basis. If they can't be hitting those three elements, then I start to question how effective the training is. And I just say that everybody, like I get students who come and say, they can't do, they literally can't do some of the class. They will sit up, they will slow down, but they don't leave. And they stay and they continue to push, which tells me I know them. They're not slowing down. They're not dogging it. They just hit their limit. And their limit was about, you know, happens about 35 minutes into class or something like that or after some heavy push. Whereas I have other students who, they don't even lift their head. They're locked in the whole class. They never slow down. They match me, you know, turn for turn on the bike, both weight as well as fly, I mean, as well as uh, getting, getting wheels around. And that's the variation. So that's the beautiful thing about the spin world is that because you control the bike, you can define how light or heavy you want your ride to be. My job is just to guide and try to set a bar that everyone wants to get to. You know, that's how I look at it. I think I think my wife would agree with that. The second issue is, and it kind of links on to that, you say it can burn up to 1,000 calories in an hour, which is basically two-thirds, two-thirds, maybe half of a healthy daily diet for a male. Is that 
too much in one session. That goes back to shouldn't shouldn't people that want to be athletes only train like athletes? Well, okay. So now remember, calorie burn is tied to size. So like people I see burning a thousand calories, always men. I have yet to see a woman get anywhere close to that, just because of the difference in size. It's always men, and it's generally big men. And I don't mean big like heavy, like fat. I mean big as in these are big men, bodybuilders, six foot, six two, six four. These are bigger guys. They're burning a thousand calories. I've seen it. I've, I've had a guy show me two weeks ago. He burned over a thousand calories in class. He's a big guy. He's probably supposed to be eating somewhere around four thousand calories, four to five thousand ah, calories a day, anyway. Right. Given his size. Now, uh, women. A high burn for a woman, a normal sized average woman, is going to be. She gets to seven hundred calories. That's a good solid burn. It is rare for me to see smaller women like, you know, uh, 100 pounds, 110 pounds, I rarely see them hitting that 700 calorie mark. Generally, I, I see five to 600. Just, and, but that, even that right there, that's a really good burn ratio uh, for a class, all right? There's, very, there's, there's exceptions to that. I get women who do burn more who are smaller or whatever. But I, I'm just saying, you know, you gotta, it's not, that's not just something you relate to everybody. You have to remember uh, height and weight as well as age. You know, those, those, those things do play into it. So the 1,000 calories, people that, that burn that, they're generally So that's like the, like the maximum would be around 1,000 calories. Most people wouldn't hit that. I would, I would, not, I would not expect your average person to hit 1,000 calories, no. Okay. They would have to have, they'd have to have a pretty high metabolism, and they would have to be really cranking, you know. I mean, we count it because we do have people who do it. Um, even for me, I mean, I weigh in somewhere around 185. And I, I don't have an exceptional VO2 max or anything. So, but I would say my best calorie burn falls somewhere in the mid to high eight. And that's not always, but I do get there sometimes. And I do get other guys my size who get up to 800 calories. You know, and you, and you got to remember, if you're in that calorie burn. If you're eating properly, you're going to maintain some burn like that throughout your day. So if you're trying to lean out a little bit, it will help. But again, some of this plays into you got to be eating properly. You have to be eating three to four small meals a day. You've got, there are things that go along with it that will maximize the benefits of it. What uh, You touched on this a little bit earlier. What added benefit does heat training have as opposed to training at a normal temperature? Well, uh, okay, so this depends on who you talk to. You can say it's debatable for us from what we've seen. One, you have an increased VO2 max. It's going to, you know, that has been tested and, and done. The University of Oregon did one study. Um, and proven that you train in the heat, it's going to increase your overall uh, physical ability, okay? For me, also, it's a detox because you're, you literally start sweating within five minutes. Heat's on at 83 degrees. You start moving. We do a warm-up. I would say just about every person in the room is sweating by the time you get done with the warm-up. So warm-up lasts about the first seven to ten minutes. Um, by that point, I would expect everybody is a little, little soaked. I do consider that to be a detox because you clean your body out. Now, again, some, some medical people say that's, that's rubbish, but I would ask those people to start coming in and training with us, spinning and finding out what it's like and find it out real world, not with their, their little test tubes in the, uh, in the, um, labs, but actually come feel it in the real world. And then a, a key thing for me, that I've noticed with a lot of people is that I, I would assume it's not much different in Australia. Out here in Los Angeles and the United States in general, it's a pretty noisy world. You know, your day to day life is pretty noisy. Los Angeles is a very busy place and it's very noisy. It's hard to focus. You know, you've got a lot of things going on, multitasking, everything. When you come in and train, you, if you're having a bad day and you go to your boxing session, you may have trouble getting totally locked in. It may take you a little longer. The one thing I find that the heat does for everybody is that you cannot ignore it. It's, it's undeniable. It's on your skin. It's in your face. It's in your lungs. You feel it, and it forces you to get focused because if you want to get through the whole class, you need to pay attention to your breathing. You need to make sure that you are maximizing your movements, you know, and you're being efficient in everything you're doing so that you can sustain yourself through the entire class. And the heat really does help 
focus you in on your workout and pretty much pushes everything out of your mind while you're doing the training. That That's true for me, and I've watched it uh, have that same effect on a, a large majority of the students I train with over the years. I mean, adding the aspect of heat, it seems like a simple idea. I'm sure there's more to it, but on the surface, it seems like a simple idea. Why hasn't it been trialed before you guys did it? Well, uh we are the first, we're the first ones doing it in the spin world. But I mean, Bikram Yoga, you know, when he did that back uh, in the 70s initially, I think he started in the early 70s, I think that's right, no one was doing hot yoga. Bikram started doing it, became a big thing. In the last 10 years, heated yoga has become a huge thing across the United States. A lot of, and, and you can't, you can't, many, many studios, yoga studios, Core Power now. Um, there are several that are changed that they only do heated yoga. You know, Bikram got really big in the 80s and 90s, and uh, during the millennium, it uh, took off as a training regimen. Um, so we're the first ones in spin. I don't think we'll be the last. How much room for improvement is there in the sweatshop? What kind of additions or subtraction, subtractions can you make to the technique to improve it? Uh to the studio as a whole or to the workout itself? Or to either. I mean, have you edited it over time since you, since you, I guess, invented it? Uh, yeah. I mean, my wife has, you know, like I said, when we initially opened, we didn't have a, we didn't have a specifically clear idea of exactly how we wanted to go, and we planned on just being half hot, half regular classes. But the demand for the hot classes became so great we just switched to all hot classes. No one really wanted to take the regular classes. The reason being, we've had many people who come spin with us, and once they get used to the heat, they really have a lot of trouble spinning in other studios where there's no heat because they just feel like they're freezing, literally. So room for improvement? I would say, well, to me, more than anything, the only, the only, the one area I would like to improve is just like you, a lot of your questions have been, you know, what's it like to train in the heat? I would like to get over, I'd like there to be a paradigm shift for us in relation to people understanding that it's not that unattainable. Uh, and that's a marketing thing for us that we have to overcome. We could improve that entire aspect of our business because we get many people go, I can't do, I, I can't spin in the heat. And I go, why not? Oh, it's just, that just seems, that just seems too crazy. <laughs> it's actually a chuckle. And I said, well, a, a lot of our biggest proponents, people who come all the time were friends of somebody else who was spinning with us, who was cycling with us, and they told their friend, I, I can't go do that. And it took them six months for the friend to drag them in. And then suddenly within a month, they think it's just the best thing ever, and they're spinning with us all the time. We've heard that story numerous times. I couldn't even tell you how many times I've heard that. So that, to me, is a marketing issue I would love to overcome. and not exactly sure how to address it yet. You know, we make sure that whenever, just like I'm talking with you today, anybody we talk to who's writing articles, we make sure to tell them that it's not nearly as, as frightening as it sounds. It's, it's quite doable for an entire cross-section of people. What about demographic-wise? Is there a, like an age group or a certain culture that you want to try and attract to the sweatshop? And have, have you thought about marketing it to that certain demographic? Is, is there a group of people that you don't see coming into the gym that you wonder why they haven't caught on to it yet? No, we get, we get a solid cross-section. In fact, you know, I mean, remember, it is private, private studio spinning, so we expect it to be a little, you know, generally, you know, uh, people over 30 usually are a little more, have a little more money and a little more mobile. It's just how it goes, 40s. But we have a solid, we have a good solid cross-section of, of uh, People in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. I mean, it is truly across the board age-wise. Um, we don't let people under 18 spin with us just for liability purposes. Um, we go 16, 17 year olds can if their parents sign off, but generally we don't. And then, of course, as people get older, I mean, like we just make sure that they can handle it. It's just to fall off. I would say in their 60s. We don't have as many people spinning with us in their 60s. And as far as I know, we only have one woman who's, you know, past 70. But uh, 20s, 30s, 40s, huge, huge cross-section. Now, I think Mimi 
is the one you might be a big advocate of this as well, teacher training. What does that involve, and is it more than just knowing about what you're teaching? Uh, what do you mean? So I read on the website that Mimi is a big advocate of teacher training. What does... Well, she, she is. She did, no, she developed. She literally wrote our teacher training manual, and she does train all of our teachers. So what does that mean? So, is, it, yeah. is it more than just knowing what the sweatshop is and how to teach it, or is there something a bit more to training the teachers? Well, oh, yeah. No, there's, she runs them. It's a three-month program. Um, they're literally, the trainees are spinning anywhere from five to eight times a week at a minimum. Um, we generally handpick our, our, teacher, our teachers now and people who express interest, and then, you know, it's a combination of handpicking and people who express interest we feel will fit. And then she runs them through, uh, I mean, because there's all, she j- literally starts out with just a few different formats, and then it goes from there, teaching about the heat, teaching about the mechanics of the bike, teaching about, um, you know, connecting with the students, teaching about picking your music, teaching the trainees how to start out with one format, then two formats, then have four formats, then start to play with it so that you've got, you know, a good eight or nine different formats, and then figure out how to both get up on the bike, ride on the bike, and teach, you know, while you're working. Because it can get a little uh, tricky, you know, trying to do that heavy work while you're also trying to encourage a class and, and make sure that they're all on beat. So there's a lot of different aspects to it, and, you know, Mimi handles all that. Once, once they're through the program after three months, we then throw them up to do community rides for four to four to six weeks where they literally, we let people come in, uh, take their class at a, at a nominal cost, we charge five bucks and people get to come in take the class and then give us, give feedback, which gets handed to the teachers so they can start to understand how their class is impacting people and where they can improve on it. And then after that, we put them out on the floor. They teach you usually start out with three classes. It takes So it's about a four to four to five month process. You mentioned earlier in the interview that you and Mimi found each other at the gym and your uh, relationship developed through there. Have you seen love come to fruition at the sweatshop yet? Uh, <laughs> I want to say yes. I, uh, well, okay. I do know there's quite a... Uh, I am very aware of over the years many amorous, many amorous affairs that have happened. I, I can't tell off my head if I know anybody who's actually been married, gotten married. Um, but I do, I, I do know that does happen quite a, there's quite a bit of dating that goes on among people who meet at the studio. I, I do know that, that I know that one for a fact. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to think right now if there's anybody I know who's actually met and gotten married at our studio. And I, I don't, I don't think so. What's the process I mean, the fitness in- industry doesn't really pop out to me as someone, as, as an industry that needs a publicist. How did you guys get a publicist? I mean, I found out about you through your publicist, Alex. So how, does, how do you make yep. that, um, that transition from just marketing oh, yourself uh, to taking the no, next no, big no, step? It's, it's, it's a completely different world than you think. Ah. Um, all, all the major studios out there, all the major spin studios, they all have gigantic they spend, they spend a good amount of money on their PR companies it's in, in fact we tried to hold off the first we just hired a PR company finally after four years um, because Mimi was quite successful uh, with what we were doing in terms of getting us known out there I mean within the first two to three years of being open she got interviews she was called for interviews in the New York Times LA Times um, quite a few national and international magazines just because of what we were doing. And we found in those articles that often it was us and then four or five other national brands um, on it. Uh, so, yeah, the, the big studio, spin studios out there, they all have major PR, PR companies, I mean, big campaigns. Is that an American idea? Because I don't think that happens a lot here. Obviously, the trainers on The Biggest Loser would have publicists, but... Just uh, like well, the, the exec producer for the Biggest Loser, he spins with us. Oh, really? Yes. Is he a fit guy? <laughs> yes. I mean, his wife is one of our uh, went through our training program. One of our trainers. Okay. So, yeah, she's she's in fact one of our teachers. Have you um, ever? In fact, he came to us. He you could and uh, he came to us 
uh, to, you know, they had kids, and he was feeling like he needed to get back in shape. Started spinning with us, and then just got really into it. Uh, his wife came to us because he told her, you know, suggested she come, and she's very fit. And she got just fell in love and wanted to go through our teacher training program, and she now teaches for us. So, have you ever been asked to get the sweatshop on to the Biggest Loser? Well, they by the time they came to us, they already had a they, they've got an agreement with. Um, I forget who their fitness people are. Um, we honestly, my wife and I, have sort of shied away from doing anything that would even. We don't particularly want to be on any shows or anything. We have been asked for a couple things, and it, we we just don't want to do any reality TV. Fair enough. At the moment, because sometimes you you can't control the direction of that television. Right. Yeah, editing involved. is powerful. You know, sometimes it's great, and sometimes not. You know, and not being able to guarantee that it would be the kind of press that we would want. We just haven't gone that way. And finally, well, specifically, just to specifically, I'm not speaking specifically about Biggest Loser. I love that show, and they have a very great thing. Um, a lot of the guys connected to it. So I'm not specifically speaking about that. Finally, where can people find you and learn more about the sweatshop? Do you have a plan to take to take um, the sweatshop overseas or to other states? And where can people learn more about uh, you? We do have plans to expand. It. That is actually in the works right now. We're talking we're talking about some expansion right now. So um, we are working on it. That's about all I can say at the moment about that. <laughs> and where can people find you and learn more about it? Uh, best thing to do would be go to our website, the sweatshop dot com, and that's t h e s w e a t s h o w p e dot com. Yes, yes. Cool. Thank you very much, Jason. It's been a pleasure. Good luck with it. I hope it makes it out to Australia one day, and I look forward to to following your progress. Awesome. All right. Thanks, man. I appreciate it.